people have been finding this book very interesting um, from an international perspective, again from the lessons and particularly how how the uh, the research was undertaken because it's been participatory and integrative and that's really appealed to many people in, internationally. Well, welcome along to Heartland Strong, a podcast uh, looking at resilience across New Zealand, uh, focused on the Heartland Strong book, a book about how rural New Zealand can change and thrive. Um, And today we have Margaret Brown and Liz Wedderburn joining us for this very first episode about why they wrote a book on resilience, of all things. Um, So uh, Margaret is a social scientist at Ag Research and is leader of the Resilient Rural Communities Program and co-editor of the Heartland Strong Book. And Liz is a principal scientist at Ag Research and was involved right at the very early stages, the thinking of this program. So Liz, can you give us some background, please? Yeah, hi, Denise. Thank you. Actually, I, I looked up um, some documents today to get a dateline and 2008 was the first uh, program we put up to what was then I think the foundation of research science and technology around rural futures and we were um, it was great we, we got it funded the reason we we put the program together was that there was just so many uh, challenges coming up for rural New Zealand there was the water challenges the climate challenges the uh, volatility in prices uh, succession. There were so many different things, which have actually not differed today. I have to say the same challenges are here in a different form. But I, I guess 11 years ago, people were not thinking so much. Uh, they were thinking more about those as individuals. So you saw a really good program on climate change. You could see very good programs on water, but no real cohesive systemic thinking and nothing really about Uh, where people were kind of central. And so the programme was to pull together um, different approaches to look at the challenges and to see how they operated simultaneously. Uh, The key point was really participation and, and really being in those communities and giving them some tools and, and practices that would allow them to come together and explore what the future might look like. So we had learning platforms and we had simulation models and all sorts of things in our ideas. And um, yeah, they came to fruition over time, which was lovely. Margaret, I'm going to draw you in because you got involved in the research. When did you get involved? Well, I was just thinking, I didn't realise it was that long ago, Liz, that we actually, you know, you started this program. And my memory isn't that great, but I think I came in at about two years, approximately two years into the program, into the research program. So I I wasn't part of the big thinking. That was really over to Liz and her team, the big thinking about what was the purpose of the research, what exactly, um, you know, what were the research goals and research questions. And then I came in really, once they had set up this great lead and direction, and I took over because Liz had to move on to other programs. Liz, tell us a bit about the scope and the aims um, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the the, the real scope was to take a, um, to look at these drivers um, simultaneously and see what what it meant um, for uh, rural communities, but also for individual farmers. And so we were interested in scale. We were interested in, well, so what does this mean for all of these things happening on the farm? How can I explore what my farm system might look like? Then there was actually, but if you take that another scale, we've got to involve a lot of other people because a lot of these issues are catchment issues. So what? Um, so how will we bring those catchment people in? And then you take it in another scale, and actually this is all about local development and how will local development look in the future. There was a lot of discussions, particularly say down in Southland, about very different forms of products such as peony roses, wasabi, um, dairy. Uh, But what direction would that take and what would that mean? What would be the flow on impacts? So that was from a, a community perspective and 
from a, a research perspective, it was really to bring together what we now call integrative teams, where you have biologists working with economists, working with modelers, working with social scientists. And I think that that was the first program, Margaret, maybe you can help there, but we in fact, we did bring together these, this integrative um, team. And so part of the research was monitoring, how do you work with these mixed teams? Uh, you know, people are always very good in their own particular area, but where were the people that were going to be the systems people who were able to cross those boundaries? And the other important thing, I think, was the inclusion of the rural communities in the research. So in helping, scoping the research in being part of the research. So. Um, particularly, say, um, in Southland, we had Ventures Southland coming in and being very part of that. And our platforms that we set up um, were very much inclusive about having not just researchers talking amongst themselves, which we're very good at, <laughs> but really getting that much wider participation so that everybody could explore the future together. Yeah, and it's exploring that future together, which I think is the, the real um, key to the work and what was exciting about it. So, Margaret, tell us, how did the team go um, working together with this cross-disciplinary, cross-discipline, um, as Liz, Liz talked about? How did it go? <laughs> well, yes. Um, an interesting venture, as Liz said, we were one of the first of, um, particularly in ag research, of taking this approach to research, this multidisciplinary approach, plus it was multi-organisation and also international. So it was my dubious honour, perhaps that's why Liz stepped aside and left me to round up all these woolly pups were from that came from all these different disciplines who all spoke a different language. And then we added in the very important component of rural communities who speak a different language again. And I can say that because I actually am a farmer and live in a rural community. So it was an interesting project in the respect of bringing all these different people together to work together. And so to that end, because it was new, and the first time the group that we had together had done it, we built in a, a monitoring and evaluation program around how to work as transdisciplinary teams. And we actually... Um, realised one of the big things I think we all learned is it takes a lot more time. And we had to rethink some of our time schedules and um, milestones as we participated more with rural communities. It all takes a lot more time. That's not a bad thing. It's just something we had to be aware of and um, make more account of. If we were truly going to work as a transdisciplinary team and having you know, at the centre, community members. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so the main research achievements and the impact of the research, Margaret, can you tell us about that? Yes. Well, I mean, there are, I think, a lot of achievements. And I, I, when I was thinking about going back and thinking about this, we have, have written them all down. And they are, they're very wide and varied, as was the purpose that we wanted to assess, as Liz said, we wanted to develop tools and processes that could be used by communities, by policy makers, um, by researchers. And actually, we achieved all of that. And I think the impacts are many, and I'll go back to the scales that Liz started talking about. The research was directed at the farm scale. And we developed um, and worked with the one that I really wanted to mention was a Māori group, uh, Ngāti Pahawera, over on the East Coast. And we were looking at how they could build resilience into farm systems that have fragmented land. And we can see them actually using what we, how we work together, the processes we worked through with them in particular. We can see them using it and the results that they've had, the ways they're changing slowly their farming systems to build more resilience into their land use. At the community level, uh, there are a number of um, impacts we've had because one of the main products or tools we produced out of this program is what we've called the resilience framework. And that was really um, a tool that developed because we found when we looked at the literature around resilience, 
there is a lot of literature out there and a lot of it deals with single items or single dimensions of resilience. And we thought, um, we think in farm systems, a rural community, a farm, all are around farm systems or um, systems and not single items. And we wanted to integrate them. And the dimensions I'm talking about, resilience dimensions, are social, cultural, environmental, economic, and we added one more that the literature doesn't really make a lot of, organisational. And by that, we're talking about what organisations does a rural community need to be resilient? And it might be anything from schools, churches, um, you know, the trucking firm, et cetera, like that. So we built and developed this resilience framework. And that's been, it was for our own, really, in the beginning. It was all about us thinking what... Uh, research might we need to do so that we encompass all these five dimensions. But then the framework took um, sort of took legs and it's been used. We used it with rural communities and developed it up. And it's now been used by other rural communities. It's been used by groups like regional councils uh, to frame up their, uh, their um, thinking around resilience in their own place. And it's been used by schools. We have a couple of schools that are using it in their senior geography classes. It's been used in the un universities. It's been used in several of our ministries. Our, importantly, our Ministry for Primary um, Industry is using it. So this framework is a tool for framing up and thinking about resilience. And I must point out, Denise, what we mean by resilience, because there are several definitions but the two main ones that have come out of the literature around rural resilience are, one is the ability to bounce forwards, and that is when some, there is some um, outside force, perhaps, or some change, some driver that's um, impacting. It could be anything from climate change to, um, through to regulation. And it's the ability to change to take stock of the situation to change and move to learn and change and move forwards to a new state as opposed to the resilience definition which is bounce backwards is to bounce back to where you were before and our program is not and was never about events like earthquakes etc it was more about the slow burn changes which come about with change in regulation and slowly things change you lose the school in your rural community, et cetera. So, and just the other group that are using, um, that are, I think are impacted by our group, and, and this is uh, our work amongst the policymakers. It's now evident, because we're getting out some of our people who have been involved in this research, we're being asked to help inform uh, particular policy decisions and um, regulations within the government, and within, for example, beef and lamb. So, and the other thing I think is an important impact from our work is that all these tools and processes that we develop and or modify from, from other groups during the course of the 10 or so years are now being used in rural proofing. And rural proofing is the um, putting a rural lens over policy decisions. And I'll just, um, I brought with me uh, the government's Rural Proofing Initiative Plan, because last year, very timely, Minister Damien O'Connor announced that, uh, that policy decisions had to be rural proofed before they were put into action. And that is, they had to look at what are the likely impacts, consequences, or unintended consequences of these decisions. And we've been able to put together a toolbox for rural proofing. And we have been um, sharing it with MPI, MB, MFE, even the Ministry of Health um, asked us to come and talk and share with them how they could use these tools in their rural proofing um, uh, initiatives. Wow.
It, it's really cool, and it's the ultimate, isn't it, that research is actually used. I mean, because we do research to find out and to learn and then to hear how widely you, what you've done and the framework that you've developed and the tools that you've developed are now being used. It's amazing. And so I come back to, well, then, if it's it's out there and it's all being used, why write a book? Because it seems like it's all, all happening, you know? Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Liz. Why a book? <laughs> Well, I think a, a book is a, a very good mechanism for reaching non-researchers. Um, so, uh, I, one of the key challenges, I guess, that I that at one point I, I gave to the group was, yeah, well, this is all great, but so what? How will people reach it? How will they know about it? How will they? They won't go to journals. They won't read it. So, <clears throat> they the putting together of the book was around the popularizing of the lessons. And uh, I think that the, um, the response to the book has been overwhelmingly positive and they're flying out the door, <laughs> people wanting more of them. So I think, you know, again, it's about science and research reaching out and making its information um, more useful and more relevant uh, for people who are not going to be reading scientific journal papers. So for, for me, I think the, the important thing is for rural communities to feel really empowered. So um, I, I think the, uh, people living in rural communities, people drinking uh, coffee in Parnell or Ponsonby in Auckland really need to read it because this is Heartland and this is where a lot of their economy is coming from. So, hey, let's let's hear a little bit um, of positive news for rural communities. You know, we're hearing a lot of negative stuff. Um, and uh, we, you know, they are, they are very central to um, New Zealand's success. So I'm, I'm thinking urban people. Um, I think it's superb for your uh, education. So schools, universities, and I also think uh, particularly for policy, because as, as Margaret said, one of the things that was really important was looking at what are the unintended consequences of all of these things coming together and how do you prepare for that? So I think in preparation for the future, anyone who's interested in that, it was, this would be a good, uh, a good book to pick up. Look, it really is anyone who is interested in agriculture um, and the rural communities. I think there's something in there for everyone because we, you know, we, we wrote it particularly for the audiences of um, that North and South tone. But really importantly, we wrote it with a number of community members involved. Some of them are involved in the podcast as well. And... So I think it's really got a very wide readership right through from those doing it on the farm, doing things in rural communities. I like Liz's addition of people um, in the urban as well, understanding what's happening in the country more, right through to our local government and through to our policy makers. There's something in there for everyone. I think, uh, sorry, just to add, um... I've um, I've promoted, I, I do a lot of work overseas and again, it's flying off the shelves overseas. People are really interested in how New Zealand's coping with the lots of the challenges in the rural, because again, the issues that are facing New Zealand's rural communities are global. And so people have been finding this book very interesting um, from an international perspective, again, from the lessons and particularly how how the uh, the research was undertaken because it's been participatory and integrative and that's really appealed to many people in, internationally. So Heartland Strong is the book. It's a book about how rural New Zealand can change and thrive. You've heard it here that there's lots in it. There's lots of relevance to um, anything from a person who is sitting in Parnell drinking a coffee through to a community out in the heartland of New Zealand um, facing lots of challenges and wanting to be resilient and be able to bounce forward. I really like that, bouncing forward. Um, so thanks for your time. Get a hold of the book um, and stay tuned for further for, um, podcast episodes because we're going to be exploring what's in the book. Thanks for your time.